Good morning, and welcome to Foothills Christian Church on this beautiful Sunday morning. I want to welcome you into this space and invite you to light a candle if you have one nearby. Nathan was our acolyte this morning, and he just lit the candle at his house. I accidentally clicked on my video before him, and so I'll post that later today. But here at Foothills, we are a community that we try to make sure our welcome is wide. We are an open, firm, open and affirming congregation, and we are glad that you are worshiping with us this morning. At Foothills, we begin each worship service by passing the sign of peace. And this morning, I have a another kind of passing of the peace video to share with you. But this one comes from two faith leaders in our neighborhood. See, on Thursday, it began the holy month of Ramadan. And for the past five years, Foothills has been sharing our space with the Islamic Center of Peoria, where during Ramadan, they come every night to break their fast and have prayer. Not this year. This year, we're having, they're having to do so in um, the style of social distancing, just like we are with our worship service. And then also, the United Islamic Center of Arizona, which is just down the street at the 101 and 35th Avenue, they joined with us this past summer for our Peace Village program. And so they both have a message of peace to share with you. Hello, Reverend Becca and everyone in your congregation. My name is Didmar Faya, and I am the Imam of the United Islamic Center of Arizona, your neighbor. I wanted to share with you the way how we greet each other. Assalamu alaikum. May the peace and blessings of God be upon you. We pray for peace and blessings for everyone. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. May peace be upon you. I'm Sid Shahid, Vice President of the Board of Directors for the Islamic Center of Puria. To our friends and our brothers and sisters in faith at the Foothills Christian Church, I want to say Ramadan Mubarak. Blessings of Ramzan. Uh, this is the holy month in which we fast from dawn to dusk uh, to recognize the predicament of those who don't have as much as we do. And although this is an unusual and difficult time for us with respect to everything that's going on, we're greatly blessed as you all are. I just want to let you know that although we're not together this year, we're still thinking of you fondly we very much appreciate your friendship and your fellowship. We wish you health, happiness, and contentment, and we wish that you be closer to God in this time of self-isolation. Many blessings to you.
Loving God, we are in awe of your majesty. We look at the beautiful sky outside, we look at the mountains around us, and we praise you. We thank you for being God of creation. And this Sunday morning, we invite you into our homes. We invite you to be in our living room, sitting on the couch with our families. We invite you to be present in our service. Amen. this is a parable. Hmm. It might be. Parables are very precious, like gold, and this box is gold. This looks like a present. Well, parables are like presents. They have already been given to us. We can't buy them, or take them, or seal them. They are already ours. There's another reason why this might be a parable. It has a lid. And sometimes parables seem to have lids on them. But when you lift the lid of a parable, there is something very precious inside. I know. Let's take off the lid and see if this is a parable. I wonder what this could be. It's so green. It's so soft and warm. I wonder what could be so green. Yes, 
It could be grass or a bush or a tree or a balloon. Perhaps it is a large green meadow. Maybe there is something else that will help us. Yes, there is this. It's so blue and cool. I wonder what it might be. Yes, it could be water. Perhaps it is a piece of the sky or a mirror or a window to see through to the other side. Let's see if there's something else. These are very dark. There seems to be no light in them at all. I wonder what these could be. I wonder if there's more. I wonder what this could be. If I place it here, it looks like a road. This could be the beginning, and this could be the end. Or, this could be the beginning, and this the end. If I add another, then the road could be in between. Then this could be the beginning, and this the end. Or, this might be the beginning, and this the end. Oh, there are more. If I put one here, and one here... I could make this place very strong. It's getting stronger. And stronger. Now I wonder what this could be. It could be a log cabin. Hmm. It could be a corral. There is an inside and an outside in this place. But I think there needs to be a way to go out and a way to come in. I could make a gate. I wonder who lives here. Oh, here are some sheep. If sheep live in this place, then it must be a sheepfold. It is called a sheepfold because the sheep are folded safely inside. Once there was someone who said such amazing things and did such wonderful things that people began to follow him, but they didn't know who he was. So one day, they simply had to ask him, and he said, I am the Good Shepherd. I know each one of my sheep by name, and they know the sound of my voice. So when I call my sheep from the sheepfold, they follow me. I walk in front of the sheep to show them the way. I show them the way to the good green grass. I show them the way to the cool, clear, still water. And when there are places of danger, I show them the way to pass through so they can come safely home to the sheepfold. I count each one of my sheep as they go inside. And if any is missing, I would go anywhere to look for the lost sheep. Through the green grass, by the still water, calling my sheep by name, even in places of danger. And when I find the lost sheep, I carry it home, even if it is very heavy, even if I am very tired. When all my sheep are safe inside, I'm so happy, but I can't be happy all by myself. So I call all my friends, and we have a great feast. This is the ordinary shepherd. When the ordinary shepherd takes the sheep from the sheepfold, 
the ordinary shepherd does not walk in front of the sheep to show them the way. So the sheep wander and scatter. When the wolf comes, the ordinary shepherd runs away. But the good shepherd stands between the wolf and the sheep and even gives his life for the sheep so the sheep can return safely home. I wonder if the sheep have names. I wonder if the sheep are happy in this place. I wonder if you have ever had to go through places of danger or were lost and someone found you.
to join me in a spirit of prayer. And as we are praying, I invite you to share your prayers of joy and concern in the comments so that we can see them, see each other's prayers, and be praying alongside each other through the week to come. At the end of this prayer, I will be praying the Lord's Prayer. I invite you to pray along with me. Let us pray. When every day seems the same, with no one listening to our dreams, our hopes, our fears, our worries. You pause, O oh God, turning your head so that you can read our lips. When every road seems the same, filled with despair's potholes, littered with pain's debris, you come alongside us, O oh God, our companion, keeping us fed. When everything trips us, when every loss weighs us down, when every grief breaks our heart, you come, O oh God, with your words of grace filled with wisdom and images to teach us about hope. When everyone ignores us, when everything disappoints us, you walk with us, you talk with us, you refuse to abandon us, Hear our prayers, O oh God. Hear our prayers of concern, our prayers of joy, the prayers that have been lifted up in the comments. As we continue to pray together that prayer Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you were with us last week, then I um, invited you to think of yourself as the disciple Thomas's twin. I have a similar assignment for you this morning because the story that we'll hear is a story about the road to Emmaus. It's a story about two of Jesus's followers that are making their way to Emmaus, a seven mile road from Jerusalem to this village, but we only get one of their names. That is Cleopas but we don't know his friend's name. And so this morning, I invite you to put yourself into the story and to think of yourself as that unnamed follower of Jesus. Let us listen for a word of good news. Today's scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Listen for God speak. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. 
but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at his tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they indeed had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, How foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The past few weeks, I keep seeing references or hearing people share a reference from the 1993 movie Groundhog's Day, starring Bill Murray. It's the one in which every day is the same. He's stuck in Groundhog's Day over and over again. And the reason people are referencing this movie is because for some of us, it feels like we're stuck living the same day on repeat, day after day. Many of us don't at certain points, don't know what day of the week it is or um, could tell you the date. A few weeks ago, a church member um, sent me a message saying, I can't find today's worship service on Facebook. Help me. And I said, well, maybe it's because today is Saturday. So we are stuck in this spirit, this feeling of living the same day over and over again, perhaps. Well, this morning, we are going to once again enter into the scripture story on Easter, Easter Day. Three weeks ago on Easter Sunday, we were doing that with gathering with those women early in the morning as they made their way to the tomb. And then last week, it was still Easter in the story we studied as we were with those disciples inside that locked room. And the story that Katie just read for for us, the story of the road to Emmaus, is also taking place on that same Easter day. It's a reminder to us that the Easter story, the story of resurrection, wasn't one in which there was this immediate recognition by all the people. No, instead, it was a wave after wave of slowly people coming to understand what this resurrection was all about. We meet these two friends, Cleopas and his friend on this dirt road, A road that represents broken dreams, lost hope, empty promises. I imagine they are walking that road step by step with their heads down. Frustrated. Frustrated is not even a strong enough word. They are defeated. Taking this journey represents that they are giving up. They had stayed in Jerusalem perhaps for a few days to see if something were to happen, but nothing. All they can do is return home and try to pick up the pieces of their life up again. And then there's this man, this stranger, which isn't so strange because it was a road, other people would have been walking on it. But this man comes up to them and starts walking with them. 
And this oddest part is that he doesn't seem to know anything about what has transpired over the weekend when their friend Jesus died. His body was broken on the cross. All of his followers knew about it, and the entire city of Jerusalem, attention was focused on it, whether you were a follower of Jesus or not. How could this man not know what had happened? I wonder if those disciples, those followers of Jesus, Cleopas and his friend, would have felt tempted to just kind of ignore this man and let him walk along. Because did they really want to have to explain it to him? To relive their memory? To bring up that feeling of pain? But they do. And so they tell him. And they told him about how Jesus has died, and that how early this morning the women, they were telling the story, but we couldn't believe them. And then the worst part was the tomb is now empty. Someone had stolen Jesus' body. Wasn't his death bad enough? Now we don't even have his body to pay our respect to. Someone stole it. What were they thinking? Haven't they already done enough? It's that feeling of being kicked when you're already down. When the worst thing has happened and you can't imagine it getting worse, and then it does. My prayer this week has been with people who that might have been the case. I'm thinking of all the people who lost loved ones from this virus. And that feels horrible, I'm sure, to them. But then, on top of that pain, there's this kick to the gut in which they weren't allowed to go be with the person as they were dying. And now, they can't be near the body and grieve in the way that they would have only months ago. Feeling kicked in the gut when you're already down. A story that I keep having flashbacks during this time of pandemic, and one that I've shared with many of you, is a morning I will never forget. It was the middle of the night when I got a phone call that the church I was serving seven years ago or so had been struck by lightning and was consumed in flames. And so I remember grabbing clothes from the night before that were laying on the floor and heading out the door in a hurry. And then I parked my car as I watched in the rain, in the dark of the night, as fire crews tried to fight this fire. Slowly as the day came on, more and more people from the congregation started to gather in the lot safely to the distance. And I'll never forget that smell the smell of the fire that would linger for weeks and weeks. The fire, the building, actually stayed on fire for a good while, for a few days, because it was still smoldering. But after it had been cleared and it seemed safe enough, The staff were given permission a week later or so to go into the office because the office part of the building was the furthest part from the fire. The fire, the center of the fire was in the sanctuary, the gorgeous sanctuary that had felt so grand and magnificent but now was just rubble. The church was an old church that had been added onto over the years in different units. And our office area was the one that had been added onto the the latest and had a stronger firewall to protect it. And I remember going into my office, and I tried to grab some of the things that seemed salvageable, but really, there wasn't much. I grabbed my diplomas off the wall that were water-stained because the water from the fire hoses had risen so high. We were a church that was saying together the phrase Cleopas and his friend had said, we had hoped. It's a phrase that's filled with sadness and despair. We had hoped, we had hoped that that glass ceiling we had only installed weeks earlier in our atrium space 
the enclosed courtyard where our church gathered for its casual early worship service every Sunday. We hoped that that new roof that we had just paid thousands of dollars was going to be a way we were going to able to enjoy our building. See, for years prior to that, the glass ceiling had leaked, and every time it rained, we worshipped alongside buckets. But finally, we had replaced it, for we had hoped. And then there was a kitchen space that also was further away from where the center of the fire was. And the Sunday before the fire, we had hoped. We had just had a prayer of dedication after worship in that kitchen because we had just spent thousands and thousands of dollars remodeling it and putting in new brand new cabinets and counters and um, kitchen equipment. And we had prayed a prayer of dedication that it was going to be used for fellowship and meals and community. We had hoped. Cleopas and his friend had hoped. They hoped that Jesus was ushering in this new era, that he was the one they had been waiting on. And so they told this to the stranger who was walking with them. And when they finally got to the village, it looked like the stranger was going to walk on ahead. But instead, they decided to share a meal together. And the stranger, who they didn't recognize, who was Jesus, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it and breaking it, all of a sudden, they realize who he is. And the brokenness, as he breaks that bread that once was whole, as they rips that bread apart, they recognize Jesus. They recognize the way his body had been broken days before when nails were in his hands. Yes, they remembered all the meals they had shared with Jesus, but perhaps when Jesus broke that bread, they all of a sudden saw his scars from his crucifixion. They recognized Jesus in his brokenness. Some years ago, anthropologist Margaret Mead was asked by a student what she considered to be the first sign of civilization for a culture. The student expected Mead to talk about fish hooks or clay pots or grinding stones. But no, Mead said that the first sign of civilization in an ancient culture was a femur that had been broken and then healed. Mead explained that in the animal kingdom, if you break your leg, you die. You cannot run from danger, get to the river for a drink or hunt for food. You are meat for prowling beasts. No animal survives a broken leg long enough for the bone to heal. A broken femur that has healed is evidence that someone has taken time to stay with the one who fell who has bound up the wound, has carried the person to safety, and has tended the person through recovery. Helping someone else through difficulty is where civilization starts, Margaret Mead says. Those disciples, Cleopas and his friend, they felt like they were being kicked in the gut after they were already grant down when they thought Jesus' body had been stolen by a thief instead of resurrection. I got another call after our church was struck by lightning and was on fire. A couple of weeks later, the second call came. Our church was once again on fire. And we were dismayed. What? How could this be? What was happening? And they it described that it was arson, that someone had gone into that kitchen that had somewhat survived the earlier fire, and they had gone in to start some fires of their own. It felt like a kick to the gut when we were already down. See, we had hoped maybe those kitchen supplies we had just spent thousands of dollars on could be salvaged for the one day when we were to rebuild. It turns out that that second fire really wasn't very consequential. 
it was really small and didn't really add that much more damage. It turned out to be a kid in the neighborhood who had a difficult life, a middle schooler. And our caretaker of our church, our custodian, actually recognized him as the same boy who he had seen months earlier in the community garden our church had for refugees that lived nearby. This little boy was digging up vegetables with dirt under his fingernails, probably because he was hungry. And so Jason, our custodian, he found that boy and he invited that boy to our youth group, even though he had been the one to try to start a second fire in that space. And in surprise, he actually joined us. See, we were still having youth group. We were finding ways to still be the church, even though we couldn't gather in our building. And so I like to think that in his brokenness, this boy, that when he joined us for youth group that Sunday, none of the other middle schoolers knew he, who he was or his past or how he had tried to set our church on fire for the second time. Instead, they welcomed him. We never saw him again, but I like to think that in his brokenness, we played a small role in mending his brokenness by offering him welcome. Cleopas and his friend, they recognize Jesus when they share a meal together. The word companion means someone who you break bread with. As disciples, we say we are a movement of wholeness in a fractured world. As part of the one body of Christ, we welcome all to the table as God has welcomed us. This morning, let us gather at the table, bringing our brokenness, ready to receive wholeness. Thanks be to God. The scripture that Becca read this morning for the sermon brought back some memories when Don and I got married many, many years ago. We were given that picture um, by a neighborhood club that my mom attended. And of course, those ladies were very dear to me. And that picture has always brought back that memory. They were visiting and walking along and that's something now we can't do. Um, we would have to be six feet apart and um, there's no talking that goes on when you're six feet apart. Anyway, um, luckily there was no pandemic and um, as they were going to Emmaus from Jerusalem, they walked and talked along the road, and they even invited a stranger to come and eat with them. It was during this time of sharing the bread and the cup that they recognized the stranger. It was Jesus, the risen Christ, the Savior who had conquered death at Calvary. Now we come to this familiar time of sharing the Lord's Supper together. Even though we are in our separate houses, we as one body partake of the bread and the cup. May we as the men in our Bible story be able to recognize Jesus as he comes to us and calls us to his table. All are welcome to partake of the Lord's Supper. Now, as we gather at this table, I invite you to find your elements for communion, whether that's bread and juice or crackers and water. And I invite you to break your bread with me. As we remember that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples in an upper room where he took a loaf of bread and after blessing it, he broke it, saying, this is my body, broken for you. In the same way, after supper, he took a cup, saying, this cup represents the new covenant of my love poured out for the forgiveness of sin. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to your table so thankful that we can be your church and that we can partake of the bread of life and the cup of salvation together. Even though we are separated, may we feel your presence. Dear Jesus, may we know you so well that we will always recognize you as you come to us. We pray that during these uncertain times, we look to you and your promise to be with us even to the ends of the earth. We love you, Jesus, and it is in your name we pray. Amen.
children's ministry during quarantine because we all still want to be connecting and if you're interested in serving at foothills you're welcome whatever it is that you're passionate about there's a place for you to plug in at foothills we don't pass an offering plate but we are still doing ministry during this time and your financial gifts are still appreciated you can give over text you can give online you can mail a check to the church However you choose to give, whether your time, your talents, financial gifts, please know that you're very appreciated. Thank you for your patience. Some of you I've noticed in the comments are having a little trouble with connections and there's been more buffering. Um, so if that has been the case for you, at the end of this service, the video will still be available and you, and you can go back and hopefully it will be where you can watch it smoothly, any of the pieces that you missed earlier. Um, our internet strength here is the same as it has been all Sunday, so I'm gonna continue to explore, but I did get a notice about how as more and more churches um, move to Facebook Live for their worship time, there is a congestion, and so that might be part of it too. This past week and a half, we have received so many donations of food and hygiene products and cleaning products that we have been able to share with some refugee families that we have sponsored over this past year and they have been very grateful we are still going to be collecting those same things but now for another cause our regional minister, regional minister jay hartley has invited us to gather food non-perishable food cleaning supplies for um, the Navajo Nation. There is an ecumenical effort where um, churches are gathering those things and then it'll be gathered together to send up north where there is a great deal of need. If you are a visitor, we are glad you worshiped with us this morning and we invite you to fill out a connect card so that we can help you discover more about our congregation. You can find a link for that in the description for this um, live video. You can also find it on our website. And in that same description box, there is a link to our fellowship time that will begin as soon as the service is over. Everyone's invited to it. It's a casual time to check in and see one another face to face over Zoom. And this Sunday, there is going to be a special breakout group for all of our children, um, where Zaid Evans will be leading them in a mindfulness activity, including some yoga. 
So please um, join us for those things. Our blessing this worship service is going to come from Katie Sexton. This past Wednesday was Earth Day. Zaid Evans put, led an Earth Day worship service for us. But Katie, in her role as the director of Arizona Faith Network, has shared this prayer with us. God, our creator, you call us into being. You keep us in safety. You hold us in life. From each of our fingertips to our toes, we marvel at the wonder you have created us to be. Today, O oh God, remind us that we are representations of your creation, seeking to bring about wholeness, seeking to bring about peace, seeking to bring about healing in this, your world. O oh, infinite source of grace, O oh, infinite source of peace, be with us now. Bring us into your presence. Comfort our pain, challenge our pride. Create us again to be people of living faith. Create us again to be people of this, your earth, your people. We pray this in the name of the creator who loved us first. Amen. 